Hands-on activities are one of the absolute best ways to immerse students in science. There are so many interactive ways for students to engage all of their senses while learning. NSTA TV is back with one last episode to highlight some of the best ways to keep your students engaged and invested. Hi, I'm Sonia Mogi, back for the final episode of NSTA TV 2024. And we know you're thinking about how to bring all of the amazing stuff you've learned back to the classroom. So we're wrapping up our week with engaging activities your students will love. We'll pop into Deborah Holman and Nikki Atkinson's session to see how you can inspire students by blending art and science. I'm not gonna say it's the easiest thing to do, but the investment that you put into creating those relationships, those lifelong relationships, learning the students. Uh, the, the return on the investment will be worth every second of the energy and the time that you put into it. 2024 Teacher Voices panelists Charles Hayes and Campette Peace will share the impact community engagement has had on their journey as educators. The NSTA President Julie Luft will join us in the studio to talk about a topic on every student and educator's mind, ChatGPT. It's not able to know if kids have come to school hungry, it's not able to know uh, if kids didn't get a good night's sleep. And all of those things impact where students are in their learning for that day. Plus, we'll learn about four leading institutions who are creating greater access to innovative and interactive educational tools. We've got so many great tools, activities, and ideas coming your way today. And if you want to take a look back later, you can keep watching NSTA TV on screens around the Colorado Convention Center, in your room at select hotels, and on YouTube and X, formerly known as Twitter. Right now, let's sit down with Brian Mundell to play a quick game and learn all about our carbon footprint while we're at it. Welcome to the studio. I'm here with Brian Mundell, founder of Adventera Games. Brian, how did you get started in making games? That goes back a long way. I started learned to play chess at age five. Uh, and at age 10, I discovered Avalon Hill uh, simulation games. And in, at age 15, still in high school, I founded the Cornell Simulators Association and led that team to victory in the first World War Games tournament, which lasted two years because we had to lick stamps and send our orders back and forth across oceans. And that was fun. And so I started designing variants of diplomacy back in the, already in the mid to late 70s. Uh, I switched gears and just played games for fun for about 20 years, but in the mid-90s, uh, mid after finishing my doctorate from Cornell, uh, I found myself at Bocconi University in Milan teaching soft skills to undergraduates, uh, but mostly MBAs, and the soft managerial skills like negotiations, um, OB, persuasion, um, group dynamics, these games, or these uh, skills are impossible to teach by traditional methods. So, you know, signing readings and lecturing and then having discussions. So I was inventing games and simulations. Um, effectively, that, uh, that's the history of game design. Uh, had a lot of experience. I got known uh, throughout the academic world through my work uh, on the board of the Organizational Behavior Teaching Society as well. And, and all of your games are meant to help players learn about reducing their carbon footprints. Why is that an important focus for you? Well, uh, I grew up in upstate New York. First, I grew up in near Yellowstone Park in northwestern Wyoming, and then we moved to upstate New York, and I was part of the troop that camped the most days every year in all of New York State. So I was always into the outdoors. Uh, I was building log forts and log cabins already in my teens, and that was important to me. Uh, then uh, the environment played a nasty trick on me. In Lombardy, the air pollution is so bad that it ruined my immune system. My immune system was about 20%. Mm. So I had to leave Lombardy, uh, and I moved an hour north of Milan to Lugano, a clean city in Switzerland. And I decided that since I was leaving academia, I would dedicate my game and simulation design effort to games to try and get people to make painless adjustments to their behavior to effectively reduce their environmental footprint and clean up the planet. That was sort of my way of giving back. All right, so let's talk about this game that you brought into the studio today. How do you play this? <laughs> sure, it's very simple to play, but to understand why we chose the game mechanic we did, I'd like to talk for a couple minutes about the game itself. This game uh, is done in partnership with the Ocean Cleanup Foundation. 
And so we made cute little discs with pictures of these items and they're ordinary household items, you know, plastic cups, straws, yeah. uh, you know, uh, little toy soldiers, sandals, you know, just all kinds of plastic bottles, bags, the ordinary stuff that Americans typically, and also some Europeans, but less, live their lives with. So we load these, these objects, these, this garbage up on cute, four cute sea animals at the beginning of the game. And each player gets a rowboat and the kids basically just row out and take the plastic off the animals and take it back to the rescue ship. So these are the robots? Those are the robots. All right, can just I be these, green? You, may, you can be let's green. Let's play around. There you go. You can be green. <laughs> okay. What you do is you roll two dice. Okay. But these are special. They're special dice. dice. There's no numbers here. So right. what is so this? That number is the number of sea wave zones you can move your rowboat. And that is what happens to these guys. Okay, so this so looks like a little it's splash a, of some exactly. sort? Exactly. That is unfavorable wind. So you can choose any one of these sea animals and move it one zone further away from the boat. And I'm taking that off of you're the taking, animal out of the ocean exactly. and I'm going to put it you're in putting here. it on the boat. You're cleaning oh. up the ocean of the plastic and freeing the animal from this plastic, which is burdening the poor thing down. So at the end of the day, the real goal is the real goal for all the trash to get out of this? Of course, of but this. there's a winner. And the winner mm -hmm. is the first person to get all six pieces of junk of plastic off of his animal, liberating his animal from, or her animal from the, uh, from the mess. So it's making ocean cleanup fun. Exactly, and the, the idea here is that uh, the next time the player goes to the grocery store with mom and the mom start, you know, picks up a packages of plastic straws, and mom, don't do that, it's mm -hmm. strangling my turtle. So how do we even stop these from getting in there in the first place? That's you exactly wanna get that in people's minds. So Boylan is working on cleaning up the mess we've already made and stopping the garbage that's already in the rivers from getting out to the oceans and picking it up and then putting it in, in a safe place so that it doesn't break down and get in our bodies and cause all kinds of health problems. And get in animals' bodies. And getting in animals' bodies and through those into our bodies, for the fish especially. Uh, so that's, that's the job. But our job here is to get the kids to train their parents to buy less garbage at the grocery store and to get the parents to put pressure on their companies mm -hmm. to not put as much garbage into the air, as much plastic in. And at the end of the day, this game is helping kids just keep it at the forefront of their mind. Let's keep our planet clean. Absolutely. Thanks, Brian. Inviting curiosity and creating meaningful experiences in learning are such great ways to catch and hold students' attention. Op Syed has used this mentality to usher in a new era of science learning. Science is an essential tool to solving the world's biggest problems that we have right now. Whether you're talking about global climate change, whether you're talking about food security or water issues, extreme weather conditions, or diseases. And so today, we want kids to engage in natural phenomena and to explore science and be able to explain things that they can see in their everyday life that are also relevant to them and meaningful. Carnegie Corporation of New York has been involved in science education for over a decade. About eight years ago, when the states had started to adopt new science standards, there was a lack of high quality instruction materials and there wasn't a clear demand for what high quality instruction materials look like in science. And so OpenSciad was launched to address that problem. Science education is critical to our country's future and it's critical that students in elementary schools have access to high quality science education. Activating students who are inclined towards science is one thing, but how can we bring in students whose passion lies elsewhere? Let's learn about how to broaden our reach in the classroom by combining art and science. So today we, um, we presented a session on art and science integration um, in a, uh, the form of a project-based learning project. The more interactive it is, I think the more buy-in there is for students, and so these kind of um, super interactive things, they get hands-on, there's more entry points for each kind of learner, and that way um, students can really access that information and know that they have this new tool, in this case, like art, to, to use that as a way to access more information like this in the future. Integrating art into science, um, I didn't realize the emotional impact it would have on learners. That the connection to the, the working with the modeling clay that students did in the building of their sculptures 
allow them to connect with that organism in ways we didn't expect. Students showed up that, that sometimes struggle in other formats. They felt empowered by that work and the ability to be able to show what they know, even though they weren't able to write it or say it, they could show it. And it was just such a beautiful, beautiful um, process for us. So they're really thinking about the shapes. How does that, that feature help that organism? Oh, it has a, a tail fin. Oh, it has, a, it has gills that I need to include because it needs to breathe underwater. Oh, it has the antenna that it uses for this. So more dendrite connections, right? We're connecting more modalities of learning and we're able to then connect our hands and our what we hear, what we see, what we feel. 100% of our learners participated. And so we know that this works. And really as teachers, student engagement is how we can start to access them. We have to get folks up and moving. We can't expect folks to just sit and listen. The world we live in is a very interactive world. And so we have to uh, create opportunities for our learners to engage in the learning, to be part of it, to build things, to create things. We want them to be creators of content and engage in this art piece um, in science together. So it's a powerful um, connection between art and science. Thanks, Deborah and Nikki, for that awesome example of interactive environmental education. Every student deserves to have interactive tools at their disposal, but cost can often be a barrier to this. That's why Teach Engineering is on a mission to revolutionize STEM education by prioritizing equity. Teach Engineering is a free online resource available to anyone and anywhere of K through 12 STEM curriculum. It is aimed to democratize engineering for everyone. Well, the Teach Engineering Digital Library was a collaborative initiative uh, right from the beginning among several engineering colleges, but it really dates back to the National Science Foundation was uh, funding digital libraries in STEM fields. In the Teach Engineering Digital Library, all the content is aligned to a myriad of standards like Common Core Math Standards, most recently, the next generation science standards. We also have available for teachers or educators to come up with their own curriculum and then work with us to get it published on our website. And then we also are always looking for people to review our curriculum. Scientists study and explore the universe. Engineers create what's never existed before. So engineering is the ultimate creative interdisciplinary enterprise. Great outcomes for students start with teacher training. That's why Michigan Education Teaching School has partnered with Detroit Public Schools to offer a new proof of concept model of teacher education. The vision of the school at Mary Grove and the P20 partnership is to impact students to empower change in our communities. The teaching school is an innovation that we have developed based on medical education. We work with them for three years of what we call residency. We're trying to educate teachers here and then send them out to other places, preferably staying in Detroit public schools, but many will go beyond. Here at TSM, we have a vision for justice. We really want for our students to be able to see who they are in the world and how who they are matters to just the ways in which they engage. When you're designing and engineering a world that is socially just, you need to think about all the people in it. We believe that we could all be working together and better serve children, youth, and their families. Interactive learning goes far beyond engaging tools and activities. One of the most important ways you can facilitate interactive learning is by getting involved with your community. Let's find out how this year's Teacher Voices panelists have gone above and beyond to make a lasting impression in their students' lives. Well, interactive learning environments are created with a couple of things. First, uh, as teachers, we have to know our content, and that's why we come to conferences like this uh, with NSTA. And second, you have to know your students, you have to know the communities that they come from. Uh, as teachers, as we drive into the places that we work at, investing in those communities, uh, day after day, week after week, uh, what we find is that we, we begin to learn more 
about that community's culture, their beliefs, uh, what's important to them, uh, what makes their community tick, what makes their community unique. By investing in your community, I think it really fosters um, this collaborative ecosystem where learning occurs beyond the walls of the classroom. So by collaborating with different businesses for different services for students, including like health services, food services, um, it helps create this really supportive environment for the students to really thrive with their learning. Uh, our goal should be to gain a deeper understanding of those communities, learning what their beliefs are, uh, the cultures, what makes that community tick, what makes that community unique. Because when you find out the uniqueness of the community, you're really finding out the uniqueness of the students that are sitting in your classrooms. For my community, uh, my unique connection is that I actually grew up in this community, so I have this really special insight on like what the students are going through because I kind of went through the same struggles. Growing up, I was very impoverished and you know we were living in Section 8 housing and we didn't really have a lot of needs. And the school that I teach in is actually the same school in which I grew up and attended myself. So as an educator over the years, even when our values didn't quite match, I tried to find out what was important to them. Uh, and so I would find myself after school going to events uh, that affected the lives of my children. I ended up at football games, I've been to cheerleading competitions, I've been to birthday parties, you name it, I've probably been to. I wanted my students to understand that I was concerned about them and wanted to know them uh, outside of school hours. I wanted to know what was important to them. And then number two, I wanted to meet the people uh, that they did life with when they left school. Because in teaching students and establishing those connections uh, with the students and therefore their community, you have to know where students are coming from, but you also have to know who they're going home to. The advice I would give to other educators who are trying to forge better bonds with their community is really to stop and listen. Listen to the needs of your community. What are they concerned about? What do they want? What are the aspirations? So once you're able to identify, because every community is distinct, everyone has its own special needs, you can work together to develop these partnerships and these collaborative relationships. Um, also kind of be present and visible so that they have this trust with you. And so it really helps so that you can develop and sustain these positive partnerships for your community. I would take the time uh, and make the investment to make sure I create relationships with my students and their families. I think that's the best way to do life in the communities that we work with, do life with the students that we teach. Uh, and it's going to take a little bit of extra effort. You know, it's, I'm not going to say it's the easiest thing to do. But the investment that you put into creating those relationships, those lifelong relationships, learning the students, uh, the, the return on the investment will be worth every second of the energy and the time that you put into it. And you can hear Charles and Comfet's full stories at the Teacher Voices panel today at 1022 a.m. Community engagement is such an important part of making sure students have great educational experiences. Before we close out our show, we'll see how an initiative out of Johns Hopkins University is igniting early interest in STEM by partnering with local schools. The Center for Educational Outreach is a group of educators, STEM professionals, who have come together to really make sure that the K-12 community and students are exposed to STEM at an early age. STEM being science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. You know, post-pandemic, we knew that we had academic gaps with students, that they needed to catch up. Based on our uh, assessment results, we're seeing real progress of the students who are receiving tutoring. The kids really get a chance to learn science and engineering properties of, you know, you're going to fail a thousand times before you succeed. Because I've seen them win medals, I've seen them <laughs> jump in confidence in certain areas. When you're on the campus, it almost feels like you're a college student here and you're majoring in research and you get all this hands-on experience. When I was a high school student, I didn't know what I wanted to do and I wish I had a program like this to have someone to direct me. Our schools need help and support. And the idea that we have a structured tutoring program based on the best research and having partners who are able to work with us and deliver high quality tutoring is going to help all schools.
And with that, NSTA TV 2024 has come to an end. There was so much amazing content throughout all of our shows this year, and we don't want you to miss a thing. You can keep watching NSTA TV on screens around the Colorado Convention Center, in your room at select hotels, and on YouTube and X, formerly known as Twitter. We hope you enjoyed our show. We'll see you next year for NSTA 2025. I'm Sonia Mogi, signing off. Thank <laughs> you.